Have you ever injured yourself and had to get around on these things? It is ridiculous. And I'll tell you, it's absolutely no fun trying to, like, adjust to these. Because, uh, you know, you just... <laughs> Well, you saw uh, me come up here, right? It's, it's a challenge to get around, but it, I know the good thing about them is that eventually I'll get the hang of them and realize just how valuable crutches are. But I don't actually need them. Um, these are just for a bit of a visual aid this morning. Um, no, I, 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 I chose to come up on these crutches and, uh, and have them here for us as a visual aid of sort of the the point that I'm trying to make today, and it also relates to something that sometimes people say about the church and about God. Have you ever heard someone say that God is just a crutch? God is just a crutch. I think that is a, a great saying because while I don't agree with the tone that people take as they say it, it's true. And it's actually a, a great thing that God is able to support us in our weakness and help us to get through. And one of the things about being a follower of Jesus is it does take some time to kind of get used to and alter ourselves for how we might get about through life. But we realize, once we get the hang of it, the incredible benefit that we all get to experience because of who God is and how he supports us and gets us through. If you've got a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, where today we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 13 and talking all about the mission of Jesus. Here we're going to see sort of a few distinct stories that sometimes we can divide up as a church, and, and each instance is an incredible message for us to, to read about and study on its own. But together, what I love about this sequence of events and interactions of Jesus is that it allows us to understand really who he is, what he's about, and hopefully uh, we're able to receive how that can not just benefit our souls and how it can help us get through life, but how it can reframe our understanding of a thing like church and how we come together as the people of God. My hope is that by the end of today, if someone was to say to you, God is just a crutch, you would be able to say, thank goodness I have him because he gets me through and changes my whole world. So let's read together Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. So Jesus has just left uh, one region called the Decapolis. He's uh, now going across the Sea of Galilee back towards his hometown. We see Jesus steps onto a boat and crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. But knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain such evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, go home. The man got up and he went home. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he said. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? Upon hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I, deserve, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinner. Let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. God, we thank you for your presence among us. Jesus, I just pray that uh, today we would really grab all that you would have to say to us. Holy v Spirit, please reveal to us and speak to our hearts and our minds to inform us and change us to live in the way that you would desire for us to go. And God, would you be glorified in all this. Lord, would these words not be mine, but would they be yours. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 
So as I said, the, this, this passage is about the mission of Jesus, and that mission is, in a large part, a mission about bringing hope and healing. And so as we look at this passage, I want to use some language that we use sometimes in healing or in, in medical terms. And, and so I want us to think about this passage with these three headings, reset, rest, and rehabilitation. If you're taking uh, sermon notes, you can write reset, rest, rehabilitation. And let's start with this idea of a, of a reset. For anyone who's, who's broken a bone, I mean, how many of us have broken a bone? Dislocated something, put it out of joint. And now, how many of you have had it reset? Put back together with maybe pins, realigned, casted. We need this, right? If we break a bone or dislocate a joint, in order for us to continue going and to be healthy, it's got to get put back into place. It needs to be reset into place to allow proper healing and for us to be able to use that, that joint or that limb again. And, and we do this under the supervision of trained medical professionals. And in most cases, we end up at least with most of the strength back. When Jesus came, though, he didn't come to be an orthopedic surgeon. He came to earth to reset something that was even more fractured, even more broken than a limb could ever be. Jesus came to right what was spiritually broken about humanity. And that's ultimately, as we look at the teachings of Jesus and the teaching of the whole of the Bible, the fact that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's one of the famous passages, which is just a really churchy way of saying that we've all missed the mark of how God wants us to live. And because of that, we have fallen short of being able to be in relationship with God. And we're short because God is holy. He's perfect. He's pure. He's blemish-free. The term holy really means being set apart. So he's set apart from anything that doesn't fall into those categories. And because we have fallen short of that, because of the ways we've rebelled against God, because of our, 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 our wrong thinking and actions against other people and the world and the ways of God, we have missed the mark. And so we are broken away from God. You could say our relationship with him has been fractured, and this has led to other brokenness and ultimately death coming into our world. But the great news about God is that even though he's holy, even though he's set apart, he doesn't want to exist in this way, and so he came to take upon himself the resetting of humanity into relationship with him. And so Jesus came in the flesh. We call him God incarnate because God came down to earth in the flesh to live amongst people to accomplish this purpose. And we see it right here in the text. In verse 2, we read that Jesus saw a paralyzed man who was brought to him by his friends and he had faith in who Jesus was. And so Jesus turns and says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Later on in verse 13 of this passage, we see when the Pharisees are addressing and kind of challenging what Jesus is really doing in this specific situation of hanging out with a bunch of tax collectors and sinners, Jesus' response is, I haven't come for people who are righteous. I have come for the sinner. Jesus reveals to us what his purpose is. His purpose is to bring healing to those who need it. He wants to bring healing to those who seek it. Jesus says, I have come to forgive sin and to bring healing to the brokenness that you find in the world. And we see ultimately that Jesus will bring a culmination to this on the cross. Jesus first goes around and he, he brings little bits, a little taste of the meal that's to come, so to speak, by healing someone here and someone here and coming over into another community and performing the miraculous. And in this case, we see he's just been in Capernaum. He's done all these healings previously where he's gone to the centurion and his servant. He's gone to other lepers and to Peter's mother-in-law. He's crossed across the Sea of Galilee. He's literally dealt with demons and brought freedom that people have never before known. And now he comes back to this man and brings healing to the paralyzed. But ultimately, that will all pale in comparison to the fact that Jesus goes to the cross. Jesus goes to the cross as the culmination of his mission on earth, which was to die 
for the sins of the world, to reset what has been made wrong by us as the people he created. He says, I don't want you to live in this way that will lead to ultimate unhealth. I want to live, you to live in a relationship that is bound and tied with me that grows in a healthy direction. But this brings a lot of questions for people. If people go, well, what gives this guy? What gives this guy the, the authority to say he can do this? What, what gives this guy the ability to go around calling himself equal to God and saying, oh, here, paralyzed guy, your sins are forgiven? This is the, the, the response we see of the Pharisees. And I think if we were in this situation, most of us would probably say the same thing looking at Jesus. Who are you? What gives you this authority? And we see this in verse 3 when, of, of chapter 9 where the Pharisees say this. They say, this fellow is blaspheming. And really what they're saying is this guy's equating himself with God. This is outrageous. It is scandalous. This, everything seems wrong with this. What is he doing? To which Jesus replies, well, watch this. <laughs> Let me show you why I can say this. Let me show you exactly the power that is to come. And we read in verses 4 to 8, knowing their thoughts, and we don't know how he knows their thought, whether it's supernatural and the Holy Spirit reveals it to him. We don't know if he reads the room and sort of sees the Pharisees interacting, goes, I know where they're going with this, but, but he knows their thoughts, and Jesus says, why are you entertaining such evil in your hearts? And he asks them a question, a simple question. What's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk. What's easier to say to a paralyzed guy who is living his life on a mat on the street? It's easier to say, your sins are forgiven. It's not visible. It's not tangible. You can say that. And, and is it true? I, we don't know. Like, maybe he did it. Maybe he didn't. And, and Jesus says, I don't want to leave you with that. I don't want to leave you questioning who I am. I don't want to leave you challenged and being in a wrong way of thinking. He says, I know there's evil in your heart. He recognizes there's something that Satan has put in their hearts to not recognize him as God. And he says, I do not want this to exist, and so I'm going to show you. I'm going to do the harder thing. And so he turns to the, this paralyzed man who he's just forgiven. And he says, all right, get up, grab your mat, go home. And this man who everybody in the community would have known was a paralyzed man who would regularly be begging on the streets is able to get up for the first time, roll up his mat, and walk. That is the power and authority by which Jesus teaches. He's revealing it to them. And so he says, take this and go home. And it's so spectacular. We read in verse 8 that the crowd sits in awe and they praise God and they recognize that, he, that God has given this authority to man. Now Jesus and the Pharisees and all throughout Scripture, we actually see this, uh, the, this statement that's talking about a son of man. A son of man. And it's important also to know what Matthew's trying to get at here. Matthew is trying to pick on uh, or, or take the words of Jesus and sort of highlight them for us so that we understand the fullness of what Jesus is actually alluding to here in his ultimate mission that he's coming to accomplish. Remember, Matthew's first readers would have been uh, first century Jewish people who understood the Jewish scriptures, and they would have been looking for certain things. And, and so as they would have been reading the Gospel of Matthew, they would have sort of seen this whole thing unfolding. And, and so we see that he highlights this phrase, the Son of Man, and, and it's connected to other scriptures. For instance, we see that it's connected to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is this book which is written and it has a whole bunch of prophetic teaching and it, it talks about these visions that are seen to, to reveal what's true in the spiritual realm. And we see this term son of man come up there and it gives us a bit more about his mission. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 to 14, uh, it says this, In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man. And he was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All peoples and nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed." 
Matthew's trying to get the, and, and trying to reveal the fullness of what Jesus was coming to do. He was coming to bring a reset for people's lives as he established his kingdom in their lives and on the earth, one that would go on forever and could never be destroyed. And here we see Jesus revealing it. Here we see Jesus alluding to himself as this son of man, one who could bring what only the one appointed by God could do. Jesus is saying, I am the great physician, the one who is the restorer of the sinful heart and the broken soul. And he wants us to know he is the one alone who can do it. And that's also a very important part for us to consider. We need to come to an understanding that we cannot reset ourselves. We live in a world that tells us a a lot about how we can go about being good enough or right enough or passing the, 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 the test enough that one day we'll be made right with, with God, maybe one day we'll get to heaven, one day everything will be good because of what we can do. But Jesus wants us to understand in the way that he's teaching is, is that that is a misunderstanding just as much as it would be a misunderstanding for any of one of us who broke an arm and doesn't know anything about the body to go about trying to set our own broken bone. It's just not a good idea. <laughs> you need a trained professional. The reason these people have come to be these trained professionals in hospitals is to help people who are hurt grow into a place of wholeness. In the same way, Jesus says there is no way that you can reset your broken soul. But I have come to write it and make it heal and grow in the right direction. But make no mistake, I'm the only one who can do that. And this is freeing. This is actually really, really good news because a lot of us hear constantly this barrage of you need to take it on your own shoulders. You need to do good enough to pass a test. In fact, I was just uh, watching an old uh, Larry King special where he sat down with different leaders of different faiths and they were talking about how they were to experience Uh, uh, getting into heaven or experiencing the fullness of eternal life. And they had this rabbi who was sitting on the panel next to a Christian leader, and he said, what I believe is that we need to make a passing grade. He said the whole reason we set up rules and regulations as Jewish people is because we want to protect anyone from possibly failing the test. And so we have created these boundaries by which we must live so that if we do it most of the time, each and every one of us will get to go to heaven and experience Yahweh. And it was this great debate that takes place, but that debate is all torn down when we look at the person of teaching of Jesus. And we should not look at that as a hopeless thing, but we should look at that very hopefully. That Jesus says, I alone can do it. So I don't expect you to. And that's where we move from this place of reset into a place of rest. Just as we need to get a bone reset, we then need to rest it. So we hop on crutches, we wheel ourselves around in wheelchairs, we lay on bed rest to allow healing. Jesus comes and he provides such a thing. It's really easy for us as people who live in this day and age, in this culture, to miss what happens next after Jesus heals the paralytic. We see this transition where he goes and he calls Matthew and and Matthew starts to follow him and immediately after that happens, they throw a dinner party. As soon as Jesus is called Matthew, a party happens. Time to set the table and have everybody come over. And we see that Jesus tells, obviously, Matthew to go and grab some other tax collectors to come to his house and and sit down for a dinner. In verse 10 and 11, we read, While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. What's the big deal? Well, what the big deal is, is that in ancient Middle Eastern and Near Eastern culture, sitting down for a meal was a production. It was a huge event, and it was meant to showcase the extravagance of your care and love for someone else. 
In Middle Eastern culture, even to this very day, how you host something tells you everything about the host. It's expected of you not just to have a Martha Stewart clean home and set plate, but it is all about creating a full experience in which a person knows their value. To come into someone's home in the ancient Near East would have looked like being able to come to a place where you could unload your baggage, you could have your feet washed, you could sit down in a comfortable seat, and you would be served the best food and drink that someone was able to provide, and they would provide that even to the point of extraordinary sacrifice. In the ancient Near East at the time, it was not unheard of for a host to give up so much food to their guests that they would starve for the next few days. It was this expectation of hospitality, of love to be displayed so extraordinarily that a guest just had to lift a finger and they would receive everything that they could possibly need. When Jesus goes from healing a paralytic man in the street to sitting down with a bunch of sinners and tax collectors, he is saying, I want to give you something extraordinary. I want to love you in a way that you might never otherwise be loved. And this is very countercultural. We miss this, but notice what it said in verse 11. It says, When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? The reason they're saying that is they're saying these people aren't good enough. These people haven't done enough to get in on religious society. They actually live their lives in kind of a, a vile and icky way. And so we're actually going to keep them on the outside. And there should be no way that they should be allowed on the inside with this great teacher, this rabbi. What, what, what is happening here? The culture of the day was to say that you have to be good enough to be in my home. You have to do certain things and live in a certain way and achieve a certain status if you're going to come into my house because I'm at this status. I've achieved this much. I am this good in our society. Jesus totally flips that paradigm on the head and he says, I am the pinnacle of society and so I'm going to call the people who are lowest, the people who can't do enough, the people who aren't good enough, the people who are outsiders everywhere else. Jesus says, I want to provide rest for those who need it most. I want to provide comfort and a place of love and hospitality, even if it costs me and my followers. And he does just that. He does just that. Time and time again, as we go through the accounts of the gospel, we will see that Jesus lays himself on the line so that everyone who would come to his presence could find rest. And this is good news, isn't it? I mean, even to this very day, everywhere we go, the message that we will receive is you can have rest when you're good enough, when you've performed enough, when you've achieved enough. And if you can't do that, you better keep on going on the hamster wheel and running and running and running until you catch up. Jesus says, this isn't what I want for you. I want instead of you to carry burdens and to carry problems and to carry yourself and trying to find a way to peace and rest to simply come and be in my presence. Jesus once famously said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. A lot of us have the wrong impression of God. We think that he wants to beat us up, or he wants us to perform enough, or that he sets a list of do's and don'ts for the purpose of knowing whether or not we can fit in, but really all Jesus says is come and find rest. I want to give you a sense of of peace. And that's a relief. It's an unloading of a burden that we all carry in so many places of life, and that is what we find in him. But it's not what we find everywhere. It's not even what we always find in the church. And so Jesus also came to bring some rehab. 
Jesus came to rehabilitate his people. And we see that by how he interacts with the Pharisees. These Pharisees are supposed to be the, the, the leaders of the faith. They're supposed to be the ones who are sort of at the, the pinnacle of, of worshiping God and showing how other people how, how we should worship God and how we should treat others. And, and they've come to this place where they have this attitude and they've created these caste systems of, of people who meet the certain spiritual benchmarkers and, and who's in and who's out on religious society. And Jesus has come to rehabilitate them. When we rehabilitate someone, we take them through a series of steps or training to to help them get better. And this is what he does. And we read it in verse 12 and 13. Jesus responds to these Pharisees who are questioning what on earth Jesus is doing by saying, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call the righteous Not the righteous, but sinners. There's a little phrase right there in verse 13. Go and learn. Go and learn. We kind of just pass by that. We're like, oh, Jesus is saying, okay, you need to go and and figure this out. But what's happening is Jesus is actually giving them a huge slap across the face, so to speak. In rabbinical tradition, so where the rabbis would teach their, their students, this was a phrase of rebuke. This was like the ultimate, like, get out of my presence. You have no idea what you're talking about. For a rabbi to tell his student to go and learn, they're basically saying, you have it completely wrong. Go back to scripture and don't come back till you figure it out. Jesus is actually telling them and he's rebuking them in the same sort of way that we saw Jesus deal with the demons in the same sort of way we saw Jesus deal with the storm as he was saying. He's saying what is happening here is evil. It needs to get out of my presence until it can be made right and until you are back in line with the teachings of scripture. And Jesus does that by quoting uh, Hosea chapter 6 verse 6 which says for I desire Mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. This is a passage where God was trying to teach his people. He wants them to seek him, not steps towards religiosity. He wanted people to find their place and identity and hope and purpose and mission and fulfillment all in his identity, not in the identity of what they could do to, quote unquote, be good enough or do what's right, or reset their own wrong. Jesus says, I'm not here for the self-righteous, but I'm here for those who need a great healer who want to come into his presence. And this is a message that the church still needs to receive today. Like it or not, we do this. We do this. We look around at people in our lives. Maybe it's that family member who we don't want to sit across the table at at a family gathering. Or maybe we do it to that coworker who has all the problems in their life, so we'd really rather not talk to them on our lunch break. We do this in all sorts of places where we look at people who are in the midst of the mess and we say, I am not getting involved. I am staying away. These people aren't good enough to be in my presence. They're not good enough for me to go to them and show this hospitality that's the example of Jesus. They they aren't good enough. They aren't right enough. They aren't perfect enough. They aren't welcome enough. And we do that in our personal lives, and sadly, we can do it in the church as well. And it's a crying shame because this is not at all the example that Jesus has given us. Jesus says all are welcome. Everyone who is sick and broken and hurting should be in my presence. And we see that he takes Matthew and immediately he says to Matthew, Matthew, what I want you to do is go to all those other tax collectors. I want you to go to all those other sinners and I want you to bring them into my presence. And together we will sit and find rest all centered in the presence and identity of me. What do you do when you see the mess? How do you react to those who are less than the best? 
Do you go to the way them in the way that Jesus calls us to go in the way that he went himself? Or do you keep it all on the outside? My hope for us as a church is that we would be able to come to be a place like a hospital in all of its glory. A hospital in all of its glory is never a, a, a clean and perfect place. A hospital in, in all its glory is a place where, where healthy people bring the sick into the ER so that they can receive the lifeline they so desperately need. A hospital, when it's running perfectly, provides beds and spaces to people who need to find rest as they get over whatever it is they're going through. A hospital, when it's riding, as it should, is a place of treatment and therapy. And yes, sometimes those treatments, sometimes those therapies, they'll be difficult and they'll be hard to push through. But as people learn and walk alongside people and are assisted by others, they can overcome the sickness which they carry, the deformities which affect those things that can be made right and whole. I would love for us to be a church like that. One where people who have encountered Jesus and become spiritually healthy would go out and find the sick and bring them into the fold. Where we would be ones who go and say, there is a better way to live. You don't have to stay out on the street as a paralytic or as a sinner, but you can come on in and be made whole because God has a place for you. I pray that our church would not be a place of fakeness and a bunch of phonies, that, but we would be a place of rest. Since when has church been something where it's not okay to be not okay? We should be a place where we can all come and actually expose all the ugly hurt that is within us so that other people can step in and share the love of Jesus extend the words of the Spirit, help one another walk through discipleship so that each and every one of us can be made whole. This is the church that we should become. This is what Jesus invites us into. Will we step up to that? Some of you, if you were in the nine o'clock service last week, or remember there was a bit of a disruptive presence here. And I got to admit, I did not have the right spirit in seeing that. Because my internal motivation was to turn and just tell the person, shut up, <laughs> get out of here. You're disrupting us from what we are here for. And in that, I actually lost sight of this very same thing that it, we're learning about this week. I learned about the fact this week and was convicted in my spirit that those people were exactly where they were supposed to be. We learned afterwards that it has been a group of people who had been out at a party and they were coming back in and coming down off something. And the place they felt safe, the place they could come, because one student had been a part of our youth ministry for a long time, was the church. That's where we can come. That's where we can be safe as we come on down. And yeah, it was disruptive. It was frustrating. It didn't allow for us to necessarily fully engage with what that was being shared from up here. But what was being taught to us was far greater than any words that I could have possibly brought. It was the example and the teaching of Jesus. This is something I hope for more of in our church. That we would be a place when anyone could come in the worst state of their minds and of their soul and of their body, and that they could come and find rest. And they could come and find peace. They could come and hear about Jesus. I'm so thankful that as some of them went out, there was people there to, to interact with them and share with them. There was people who prayed for them as they left. That is what the church should be. Can we step into that? Can we embrace the mission of Jesus day by day in this place and as we go throughout our week? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, we thank you that it reveals to us 
the heart of your spirit. God, we thank you that you love us so incredibly much that you would get involved with our brokenness, with our sickness, with our hurt, with the pain, with the rebellion. Lord, we thank you that you came to us when we were still your enemies, and yet you still sacrificed yourself as a radical show of love. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who have yet to receive your forgiveness your reconciliation that can be had in you, Lord God, would they embrace that today? Would they turn to you and ask for forgiveness? And Lord God, would you do something incredible to bring healing into their lives today? Heavenly Father, I pray that for all of us, we would look a little bit more like you. For those who follow you, would we be people who would be a welcoming and peaceful presence, who would be the safe place, the safe person that someone could go to at the office or at the family gathering or wherever we are, and they could come and share what is going on, and that we would be the people to hear them, to love them, and then to point them towards you. God, I pray for our church that we would rise up and, and buck the trend of being seen as a place that's... That, that's got wall set up that's full of icky, self-righteous people. And Lord God, will we be known as a place of imperfect people who love in pursuit of a perfect God? Heavenly Father, would you lead us in such a way? Would you transform us? Holy Spirit, do something in each and every one of us today that would leave us undone from the ways of the past, embracing fully the mission of Jesus. As we turn to you now, Lord, I pray that these songs of praise would be a reflection of what's going on in our heart and would they be words that would be a catalyst for leading us out into our community so that we can go out live on mission with you. I pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.